I feel as though I grew up and became an adult and found myself here in Minneapolis and in the Dinky Town Prospect Park area. Uh, and actually, I didn't move here until I was 25. So for I still feel like this, this is where um, I learned about life and became myself. And uh, I'm a person who just starts experiencing things and goes with what happens. And I've been real fortunate in where uh, experiences have then led me. And they have built on one another. So, for instance, when I came here, I was married at the time, had a two-year-old son, and uh, we moved to the area because uh, we wanted to be close to campus. We, we didn't have much money, needed to be able to walk places, um, so we moved into Prospect Park. Uh, no, we didn't. We moved into the Como neighborhood at first. So we're over there in, in the Como neighborhood, and I happened to get a job at the YWCA. And uh, uh, that job, I had gone to the University of Michigan, and I had majored in physical education, though I did not like traditional sports, and the way it was approached by most people, um, I like being physically active, I like being strong, I like hiking, I like sports, but most of the women who I knew hated that stuff, and so I wanted to find out why. Why did I like it and other women didn't like it? And that led me to really start ch studying child psychology, and then I have my own child. Um, so I'm starting to get real active, real interested in child psychology. Right before we came here, we lived in Green Bay, Wisconsin. The University of Wisconsin had just opened a brand new campus there. While there, I give birth to my son, Darius, and um, I don't know why. I, I, daycare centers didn't exist. This was in 69, at least, at least in Green Bay, Wisconsin. So I approached somebody at the university and suggested that there be a university-based daycare center. Uh, so a group of us who were young moms, you know, our husbands at the time, got the jobs at the school. Here we were with our similarly aged children, and we got the university to start a daycare center. We were empowered to hire the teacher, to, to um, do everything, to find the place where it would be. So here I come to Minneapolis. At this point, I'm a wife, I'm, going, I'm, a, I'm a, a young mom with a young child, and I'm going to be supporting the family. And I happened to get a job at the downtown on the Nicollet Mall, YWCA. So exciting. And I got it because of my background with... Um, physical activity, and because I had started this daycare center. The Y at that point wanted to open up a daycare center. Simultaneously, it hired two people who became very good friends of mine, um, and they were going to start the first women's resource center at the Y at that point. So uh, one of them, Beth Green and I, were charged with getting a daycare center going and I'm charged with working on the land-based physical activity. So part of what I did with the land-based physical activity was have, um, we call it Pee Wee Gym. And it was to bring parents, and they were almost always moms, so I'm gonna say moms, moms and kids together um, and have physical activity. So I told you I was not much into the traditional stuff. I was looking into child psychology on my own, and I started incorporating real unusual kinds of activities that were really naturalistic. So, for instance, there would be things where um, I would have uh, the moms get down on their hands and knees, and kids would climb under the moms. Or the moms, with their own bodies, would build an obstacle course, and the kids would go around, and they'd be climbing over their moms and climbing under their moms. And, and so there was a lot of this interaction that would go back and forth. Well, it turned out that these classes were very different than anything people had experienced before. They were very successful, and um, the woman who we ended up hiring to um, do the daycare center asked me if I would start speaking at some conferences for young children, for the education of young children. From that, uh, some of... Uh, 
woman who taught in the PE department who heard me speak came and asked me if I would be a graduate student. And I said, I, I don't like phys ed. I, there's, there's nothing that I like about that. And she said, if you come and work with me, um, I'll let you do whatever you want to do. And I'll get you... Um, I'll get you an assistantship. It was more than a TA. It was a, being um, called an associate. And what I did was work with each one of the nursery school classes at the Institute of Child Development. And the medium then was physical activity. So they would come to me and, and to the gym and we would do stuff together. Or sometimes then I would go into the classroom and later I did some research looking at the classroom. But but again, it was real different than um, any way to this day that I know that people approach children and physical activity. So I was on the, mostly studying child psychology at this point in grad school. And in the child psychology classes, we'd be talking about research. And people would be doing research on little kids in a situation that wasn't necessarily natural to the kids. Mostly, they'd be sitting in a chair, at a table, and then they'd be um, answering something verbally or with a pencil or whatever. Well, kids want to be physically active, so I'd be sitting in these graduate courses and I'd hear things like, um, well, children have a difficult time telling a vertical from a horizontal from a diagonal, and then, then I'd think, well, I'm going to test this out, and I'd have the kids in the gym, and, and uh, the kids used to love, you know, language is just developing. So they would love to be able to run and stop on command, partly because they're playing around with go and stop. And when you stop, put your head on somebody else's head or <laughs> put your head on somebody's knee or put your hand on somebody's foot, blah, 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 stuff like that. So, I, so instead of just saying go, I would say, when I have my arm in this position, and I would put it, in a horizontal, diagonal, or a vertical. Mm. And then they were supposed to do something physical, so they couldn't wait. They were just so intent <laughs> on watching. And I could test all these ideas out. Like, no, you know, you give the kids a chance to interact in a different way. So, all right, so here's the point. The point is the kids love it. Uh, the teachers love it. The parents start to love it. Um, and so this whole new area of physical activity and child development coming together was happening. Um, so that was real exciting. Uh, and it took me from there, in, well, first I've got to tell you this one part. So meanwhile, remember this is in the early 70s. It's not too long after Stonewall had happened. And so I end up falling in love with another woman. Um, and we, she says, it was over the trampoline in one of these peewee gym classes. <laughs> All right, so partly why that's important is um, she's also <coughs> in early childhood. And we, and um, Judy, Judy gets a job. She at first was at the Institute of Child Development. The year that special education happened in the public schools, Judy got a job in the public schools in special education. Um, meanwhile, the two of us were working with some friends who were real interested in a therapeutic nursery school. Um, we were working with um, Children's Hospital and talking with them about what's going on with kids and, and um, a therapeutic setting, a play setting. Uh, simultaneously, because of the connection with child development and with phys ed and what I was doing at the university, I started working with the kids who were in the program for autistic-like children. And now, you know, to talk about kids on the spectrum, that's very common. People know exactly what you're talking about. But even as late as the early 70s, if you said autism, so many people didn't have a clue of what that was. Um, on the whole, the literature and professionals were still blaming cold mothers um, for children who were autistic. Uh, so I was working with kids who were then autistic in the, phys in the physical setting again. And it was so exciting to watch them be able to respond to um, a child development based approach to them physically interacting with their environment where they didn't necessarily have to be verbal. They didn't necessarily have to be social. And to just watch them blossom. Okay, so 
See, all this fits together in this strange way. Uh, I've got to also back up to say that by this point, um, my son and Judy's two children, and we're together now as a family, they're going to, they're all in elementary school. My son's the youngest, um, and then a daughter who's a year older, and another son who is three years older than my son. So the kids, um, the, the Southeast Alternative Schools were just set up at that point. And, well, they had been set up right before I, I had moved here. I was not aware of, well, I had read Summerhill and was real excited about that, but I wasn't aware of all the different things that could happen within a school. So our kids went to uh, Marcy Open School, and to watch those kids, those kids loved every day of their life going to school. They were so happy throughout elementary school. Um, and that school, like it incorporated parents, and it was so close to the university that while I was teaching at the university, um, the way I, I ended up teaching some methods courses for elementary school, for people who were gonna go into elementary education and they had to have phys ed. I didn't like traditional phys ed. I'm not gonna teach them traditional phys ed, but I taught them this other technique. And part of teaching my university students this other kind of technique, and it wasn't like written in stone, it was all always an invention. Um, what I did was make arrangements with the kids at Marcy to come over to the university, and I would do something with them, and my university students would observe, and then, in the, during the next couple of class days with the university, I would talk with my university students, what did you observe, what principles of child development were happening, physically what was happening, what might you do with those kids, and then the kids would come back, the Marcy kids would come back, and my own students would have a chance to teach. And that was at a time period when student teaching wasn't happening for them yet. Student teaching was different with what was going on. So I was able to bring the Marcy kids over to see how they were responding with this. So I had all those children from the nursery school, the kids from Marcy who were coming over, and I had one more advantage with, with the kids from the Institute of Child Development. Some of them went for like three years to the Institute, and each year they would have a different teacher. So I would get to see how those kids behaved given this approach given this approach, given this approach. So sure, they matured, but they also behaved to different teachers and different approaches in different ways. So one of the things that I learned was, um, it is different kids need different approaches. Not my kids, my own children, Judy's and my children, did so well with an open school approach. Not every child wants an open school approach. Not every family wants an open school approach. And I learned that it's so important to synchronize the education that the kids have so that it's the approach is right for them, the approach is one that their parents can support, and then so much good can happen. That really had a big impact on me later when I was then teaching in high school, whatever. Um, so, so in this area, though, um, one of the things, Judy and I still to this day, 43 years later, we've been together for 43 years, we talk about how lucky we were to be in this area. Um, neither of us had ever been involved with a woman before. We had no idea what was happening, but we fell in love. And meanwhile, the people who we knew, um, many, most of whom were associated with the university or with education somehow, they, like, didn't desert us. You know, this was at a time when... Um, I'm telling you, it was really close to Stonewall. We had to, we we did worry about whether or not our kids might be taken away from us. Uh, there was uh, a woman's coffee house that was started, and at that women's coffee house, um, it was like a a big deal, you know, kind of a secret deal at first. And and in fact, when Judy and I first heard about it, we heard about it because we were at North Country Food Co-op, mm -hmm. and we were standing in line. Um, what are you, ready to pay and, and somebody came up to us and said have you heard of the women's coffee house and we both went oh, why is she saying that to us and we were absolutely panicked and scared I mean whoa so 
Anyway, I remember one time when we were at that women's coffee house and there was a performance that was happening and somebody stopped and got up to the microphone and said, you need to know that there are FBI agents in the room right now. Yeah. And, and so um, know that that's happening. And, and that was still going on back in, in the 70s, even here in Minneapolis, which was so progressive, so accepting. And, and I would tell you that um, it made such a difference being in a community that, that was so loving, so accepting. Um, I don't know what my life would have been like. You know, even uh, Judy and I, maybe naively, we, we marched over to Marcy's school right away and said to the principal, look, this is who we are, this is our family, and, you know, we, um, we want you to take care of the kids. And if anything comes up, we want to know about that. We had no idea when we said that how many of the parents and how many of the teachers and how many of the administrators <laughs> themselves were gay. We didn't know it at the time. Uh, but it was, so, that to me is, a, a, again, a really, really important thing that happened right here. The impact of the Southeast Alternative Schools, I think, was huge on the kids, on the adults who were associated, whether they were parents, um, whether they were educators. It, for me, many years later, like um, in, in 89, we, our kids were uh, all out of high school. They were starting their adult-like lives. lives and. Um, we decided to go and move to Northwest Arkansas, where uh, in the Ozark Mountains. We just wanted to live real, real remotely. Talk about a commune. This was this was back, you know, like way, way, way remote. I now live in New England, and when people ask, well, what was that like? I say, well, you can't even get that remote in New England. It's too crowded. Um, anyway, I taught in Fayetteville, where the University of Arkansas is. Um, and I started, uh, teaching high school special education. And uh, after a couple of years, the principal asked me to start an alternative program for really smart kids who were dropping out of school. Some of them were National Merit finalists. and um, I set that program up the same way I did the gym, the same way Marcy School was set up, with that same philosophy of this program is not going to be good for everybody, but for the kids who want to come here and for the families who want their kids here. And it was just in the basement of the high school in Fayetteville, Arkansas. And that program uh, lasted for 15 years through different superintendents. I mean, I'm telling you, this is Arkansas. This is the South. And this program was so progressive, you know, like, like Buddhist monks would come and they did a mandala with the kids and, and the kids helped me teach. and. Um, I mean, it, it was amazing, and it was my experience living here that let me do that, that, that let um, that whole program develop. And even in a place as, as different as night and day from here, that, that whole kind of approach, that, that philosophy of acceptance and helping people grow and involving the community, um, it, it just flourished, you know, even there. I don't know, I stumbled into that because of living here. I don't know where, I don't know where else I would have found it. You know what I mean? Um, so uh, I started doing things here too, like uh, we lived in Prospect Park. Our sweet, sweet neighbors, um, you know, several of the neighbors were runners and so um, I became a runner, eventually doing some of the marathons and stuff here, which was just great, loved it. Um, I, I know I'm not quite sure what else to say. Um, this was a wonderful, wonderful place for me. Uh, I, just let me do a little bit more. Um, again, we were both teachers, raising three kids, um, buying some land in Arkansas, didn't have much money, and yet in this community we could bike. And now I know biking you know, is, happens all over the place here. It didn't happen all over back in those years. But we could so easily ride our bikes um, to our jobs, to the university, whatever we were doing. Um, one of the things that we used to do too is we would sell our blood plasma um, to help us get through the summers. Um, and, and we did that. And do you know that we always, always felt good about where we lived? It was like 
none of the stuff was strange, you know. Everything just kind of um, fit in. And I do want to, I thought of one other thing that I want to say. At least I might keep saying that. Um, we had this property in Arkansas. We thought we might go and live there sometime. If we did, it was real remote. Uh, and one of the things that we would have to do is um, even more taking care of ourselves and taking care of our property and taking care of a home. So I took some community education classes at um, the old Pratt School. And um, I took wood woodworking classes. And simultaneously, I, had, um, I was starting to do a lot of drawing. And I was afraid to use color, so I um, I was doing pen and ink. So I taught myself to use embroidery thread as you would use ink strokes. Mm -hmm. So here, so one of the th things that I loved to do was trees, and I'm taking now this woodworking class at the community education program, and I'm working with a jigsaw. And I'm trying to think what I want to make, and I think, well, um, oh gosh, I love that tree that I did with my embroidery thread. And that tree included a tree house and then these threads went over the tree house as the leaves. So I'm thinking, okay, well, how am I gonna do that? So I thought what I'm gonna do is two layers. And on the first layer, I'm gonna put a thin trunk and some of the branches, and I'm gonna put a tree house. And then I'll make another layer to fit right on top of that and it will include the leaves. And that was our first two layer puzzle. And that, experience then led to people love that puzzle. And so then I started making other puzzles that were multi-layers like that. And the puzzles, I'm simultaneously doing a lot of consulting in early childhood and, and particularly um, bringing together physical activity, behavior, emotional, social. So I'm thinking, all right, well, what I'm gonna do is make these puzzles showing children doing things that are really healthy in terms of growth and development. So I want to depict children doing the things that I'm trying to tell their parents and teachers about. So I'm designing these puzzles. We start making them right in our home. We buy a jigsaw, we're making them. And then we even start hiring people. So we have this little puzzle business and we're told about a man whose name I'm going to forget, but he lived just inside St. Paul and he had invented some screens. I think it was for maybe General Mills. It was, they were for the, he the flower sifters for flour were much like silk screens. Mm -hmm. So he developed how to make a silk screen frame and put the silk on it, and then um, he went on to use that then with silk screen as far as inking and printing and he developed a kind of a jig kind of thing so you could really line the stuff up. He got us into silk screening. So it was, it was the kind of thing that would happen in Prospect Park that somebody would say, ah, that's really good art. Now you have to start really silk screening those because you can't possibly keep producing them by hand. I know somebody who knows about silk screening. Go over and talk to this guy. So you go and you talk to that guy. And then he says, all right, now if you're gonna do that, you've gotta start getting into this kind of equipment. Go talk to these people. And, um, to be able to take advantage of that was so, so wonderful. And it just happened naturally. And that leads me to think, too, of the co-ops here. Um, now, I live in a little town called Greenfield, Massachusetts, and it's by Amherst and Northampton, where Smith College, all these different schools are. Okay, so a guy who lives in our community, um, one of the things that, that invited us to move there is our sons lived in the area, but also there was a food co-op. And from living here in Minneapolis, we learned to love co-ops and use them all the time, including the bike co-op that, I don't know if it's still here, but it was very important to us. Anyway, so here now in Greenfield, Massachusetts, some guy who we had never met who um, does videography makes a wonderful documentary on um, the cooperative food movement. And I bet a quarter of it is about the co-ops here. And with old, old footage, you know, of Seward Co-op, of North Country, of places that are now closed down. But it felt so special to have, to, to go and see this wonderful documentary. And here so much of it is based on what was going on in Minneapolis. Uh, 
So there you have it. I am so thankful for this community. This is the first time I've been back in about 20 years. And now to come back and to see the public transportation system, to see the co-ops that are still there, Seward Co-op is still there. I just was there. It's just magnificent. Um, there's just something about this place that is so wonderful. Um, the spirit that promotes cooperation and this attitude in which I, there's a real fast uptake of ideas there an idea in the morning and there a prototype in the afternoon <laughs> and somebody has founded a business with a logo by <laughs> the next day. I mean, this is a story we've heard before. And um, it's an atmosphere I benefited from also. But it don't happen everywhere. It may not ha be happening in a certain way as much. Now... One can get all mystical about it and say, well, it's a little bit like you know, fetal development. It goes crazy until you have the baby and then, <laughs> <laughs> and then it slows way down. But I'm wondering what your thoughts are, what your memories are, of what made that, that possible, the, this cooperation, this kind of, this sense that anything could be done, that... Anything that somebody says wasn't just, you know, useful information, a kind of footnote to your life, right. but was, you know, opening up a road to yes. some place you could go. I mean, I know what that feels like, and I don't know what the magic is. Um, um, I think this is where I learned it. And I think that I've experienced um, not as, not the degree but what the magic partly i think has to do with when people are really willing to talk it i think it there needs to be a community of some sort a real sense of community so and when i say that i mean like people interacting you know truly interacting truly listening to each other um and not just listening to each other but truly hearing one another um and getting excited for somebody else. So I'm even going to say, like, where I live right now is, um, you know, it's just off of Main Street, and it, it's a dead-end street. And people, you know, like, they'll keep saying things like, you and Judy, you know, you just bring people together. It's not that. It's partly, we're a dead-end street, so we can come out and talk. I, you know, and people on our street, and our street is very, very diverse, um, um, socially, economically, in terms of occupation, you know, on and on. But um, if we had to go and knock on one another's doors, we would not see each other the same way. I know that when we lived in Prospect Park, you know, one of the things that was so different then was kids played outside all the time. You know, so the kids would be outside playing and running around. The adults would come out, you know, and we would be talking. It was so easy to interact. It wasn't like we had to go and knock on a door. And I think that whatever it is that lets people come together naturally, and when you say that about kind of the excitement about um, things blossoming, I think if it's all like-minded people, they're not going to blossom because so many of the ideas are the same. I think one of the things that helps the blossoming is when different kind of ideas can come together. So, for instance, when I was saying I didn't like traditional phys ed, but I had that background, and then child development, and then something incredible and magical happened by bringing those things together. Um, I think that I've experienced that kind of thing. When The, the same thing when I was in Arkansas about... Um, about creating that school. Um, also, here we were, two women. We lived way out in hillbilly country, and people were truly afraid for our lives. We mm -hmm. never locked our doors. We never had a problem. We were invited. I mean, we were invited to, to family reunions where people would come riding out of the hills on mules. I mean, I tell you, I lived the Foxfire books for 18 years. Mm -hmm. It was magical. But I think, and I think one of the things that 
that brought us into that part of the community, you know, the hillbilly community, was again being willing to listen and not having the same ideas, being able to treasure one another um, because w whatever. Um, but then in Fayetteville, that's a university community. And so there were things that were treasures by, by bringing, again, different ideas. But I think that people have to come together. There's got to be some kind of mechanism, whether it's a community garden, like I took the light rail today, and I saw back on 4th Avenue, um, close to where Harris Warehouse, you know, anyway, I saw this community garden that didn't used to exist. A community garden was another thing that attracted us to our present community. Um, and when you go to a community garden, all these people come together whose backgrounds are different. They have gardening in common, but even their ways of gardening is, happen to be different. So again, you know, like, just that having differences and yet some kind of place that brings you together. I think that that's part of the magic. And if you don't have places that invite that coming together, I don't, I don't know how that magic happens because then people are isolated. Yeah. As I was experiencing the revolution through a glass darkly, uh, I had the sense of sort of emerging guruhood here and there. I mean, there were people who were at the heart of all kinds of things that were going on, and they were the reference points for groups, and they were the point people you pointed to to explain things. Was your experience like that? I mean, were there some large fixtures on the on the intellectual and cultural landscape, or was it more this kind of diffuse stuff? More diffuse. Uh huh. And um, yeah, more diffuse. Uh, there are people who certainly know more than I do about a lot of different things, and I like to hear what they have to say, but then I'd like to be able to, um, to maybe try some things out, uh, maybe adapt myself, but um, I think often for me when there's a guru, I often kind of go the other way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Although one time I can still remember this, it was, um, it was a gathering, um, I'm going to forget it. I'm going to forget the name of this wonderful theater group. What was that women's theater group? Martha Bowles and Foot of yes. the Mountain. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. Foot of the Mountain. Yeah. Oh. Okay, so we had just been to a performance, and we went to, um, to a party afterwards. And we walked into a room, and there were all these women sitting on the floor, and there was one woman sitting here, an older woman, and she was speaking, and all these women were looking at her, and, and it, it, it turned out to be Marital Lesseur. And you know what? I absolutely wanted to hear her. But then, would I just follow and be a groupie? I wouldn't. But was that a treasure? That was such a treasure. And I remember hearing Gloria Steinem in Loring Park. Was that a treasure? It was such a treasure. You know, there were those. So, but um, I think to this day, when there are people who... Um, if there are people, I think it's more people who kind of know their gurus. If there are people, you know, I tend to shy away. I have a follow-up question. Um, I, it's, and it's about your relationship and what you think about the YWCA um, from back in those days when you were starting here. Uh, I had a long history of fascination with it myself. I had an aunt who taught in the YWCA in Greenwich Village in 1932, a class on psychological mindedness for career girls. Wow. And so I have a, a fondness for the Y, and uh, the fact that they seem to really care about combining the body and the spirit, and I don't know, there's is there a third thing, but um, I know that there's, uh, 
there really is an impetus towards engaging the whole person. And something must have been going on in the why. I'm sure it goes through cycles, but when you were there and in that era, and you mentioned a women's resource center, and was that connected to the why, or was that was just another idea? Yeah. The why, you know, I, um, that was a brand new experience for me with whys. And that why was fantastic. Um, and again, I don't, maybe it was the times, I don't know. But here I am, a young woman, I'm like 24, 25, a brand new employee. And um, one of the things that the why has been working on for uh, at least 30 or 40 years has been racism. And it's been committed to that. So here I am, brand new hired. Mary Lee Dayton was the chair of the board at that point. And um, every year she would sponsor um, these two people whose name, they might have been Tillison, something like that, a, a man and woman, a husband and wife, um, black people, who came and taught about white racism. I had never heard that before. It was outstanding. And what they talked about and the examples that they gave, I could apply then to my teaching right then. I could apply to my life right then. I had never heard about racism focused in on, on white people. And now, you know, they talk about, ah. Oh. So, so um, I was lucky enough, even then, for whatever reason, I was one of the people who got to go to a national convention. And it was out in San Diego. And... Cesar Chavez is there. It was all these issues about race and immigration and, you know, the great boycotts and the agriculture, the people working in agriculture. All these issues are coming up and it's a why convention. Those are the focus of the convention. Incredible. Incredible. Um, and certainly not too early for the times, but early for a lot of what was happening. And the why was really committed to that. Like when we would have programs, we would have to really, you know, consider that. You know, it, it wasn't just lip service. It, just, it wasn't just we're going to have these people coming for this week. We're going to have a national convention and for, you know, this. It was, there was a real commitment about it. Model Cities was going on then. And how can we get our programs really going into Model Cities? How can we bring more people in? So, so that was for sure true. Um, you know, I feel kind of silly, but I didn't know anything about yoga and stuff then. The Y had yoga classes. I didn't know that. They would bring in people who, who now are some of the leaders in the field of, of, of Buddhism. You know, I don't think we ever brought Jack Cornfield in or somebody like that, but, but these big people, you know, who came, and, and that was the Y the Young Women's Christian Group, you know? Um, and then to have it take on a daycare center, there were other daycare centers in the area, but to say we're going to have a daycare center right here downtown and we're going we're gonna to commit to this, that was huge. And the Women's Resource Center was right there. It had its own office. Jerry Sutter, who lives, you know, she lived in Prospect Park and she's still here. I'll give you her, that mm -hmm. contact. Um, Jerry helped start that that Women's Resource Center. Beth Green was the other woman who helped start that. She now lives out in Massachusetts, where I live. Um, but uh, that Women's Resource was to, to bring all, it, it was just so early on with the women's movement. And the why was totally, totally behind it. So um, even its commitment to being downtown, you know, the, when I was there, <clears throat> my second year there was when they raised the old building and they started to build this Y. And this Y being funded the and the fundraising being done by women was uh, revolutionary at that point. People suspected that, that under no circumstances was that building going to be funded. That building was never going to be built. And it was because women were doing the thing. Yeah. And uh, so in those days, all that was real revolutionary. And um, I, I think that, you know, the Y, uh, the YW, um, to this day, like in Massachusetts now, they still do those kind of programs. Our, the old Y here 
had rooms upstairs, you know, like where women could stay. And it was still that old history. Mm -hmm. The new Y, I don't think, has any of those rooms, those facilities. But there are still YWs in the country that do have those facilities for women and that, that are still so committed to, um, to helping women in transitions in their lives and stuff. So, uh, yeah, that, that again was so lucky to fall into that experience. Oh my goodness. That's really cool. no. um, what was the name? The, the Women's Resource Center became, wasn't there a, a different building then that was over by the Art Institute? Or am I, am I thinking of something else? Um, uh, I, you know, other places might have started up, but I think, well, wait a minute. There might have been a connection because when they raised the old building, we all had to find different locations to keep our programs running. Uh -huh. So, and, and I then stopped anyway and went back to graduate school. So I don't know what happened during that transition time between the old building gone and the new building coming in. So it might have been that the Women's Resource Center, which continued, it had to find different housing. It might have been there. Um, skipping back to uh, when you said you moved to the Ozarks, uh, Western Arkansas, um, and you were able to take with you what you had uh, been exposed to and what had blossomed in this community and transplant it, really. It really, yeah. Like, yeah. What was uh, the attitude towards being two women living together out there in the hills? Was that... It, it, Right now, we have this idea of being northerners that, oh my gosh, that would be really hard in the hills of, of Arkansas. But right. was it hard, or were things also um, different enough because of the university atmosphere? And uh... um, So I taught in Fayetteville. Mm -hmm. So here's Fayetteville, um, probably the most progressive town in Arkansas. Um, and then we lived 60 miles away in a in the mountains. Um, and so here's the hillbilly country, and then here's progressive Fayetteville. And just let me tell you this, that the people who lived up on the mountain, they would say, oh, aren't you scared to go into Fayetteville, into that big city? <laughs> no. The people in Fayetteville would say, whoa, aren't you scared to go back out on the mountain? No. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, but the Really, it was like living, the, you know those Foxfire books? Yeah. Those old folkways? Mm -hmm. um, it was such a treasure to live there. And this is what, this is, this is all Judy and I can think of. Um, one thing is, it seems to me that as long as people are open, like for people to know that we're a couple, to people to know that we're committed to each other and love each other, then they can understand us. If you try to be closeted, they don't get it. Yeah. You know, and then it's kind of weird. So we also weren't closeted up on that mountain. And we loved that land. We loved doing physical work. Um, I, um, I'm telling you, a lot of people didn't even have running water, and they didn't have electricity. It, and, and some people were still clearing areas with mules when we got there. Um, so if we got a call on our party line, if we got a call that said, that somebody was coming down the road leading their herd of cows, um, and would we come out to keep the cows from going off into the woods? We would always say yes. And if those cows took off, and if they started running through a patch of poison ivy, we ran through that poison ivy. I mean, we were hard workers. We loved the land. We were honest. We loved those people. We loved the music. I mean, the music was... It was so authentic, it was older than bluegrass. It was the music that was passed down. And these people with these gnarly, old, beaten up hands would take out their instruments that were old and beaten up. They would play music like, we were so lucky. We would get invited to these square dances and they would clear out a house and they were little old, they were little old Appalachian-like houses. Clear the house out, they would have these squares and every square would have its own collar. I mean, I'm telling you, and we were totally accepted by those people. We were totally accepted. I don't, why was that? I don't know. I don't know. But, um, so, uh, I, we loved them. They loved us, and they weren't kindred spirits. You know, like, 
when we got to the point where we were going to retire, not only had our sons moved out, you know, pretty close to one another in um, Massachusetts and Vermont, but we thought, you know, um, really people who we, who are more our kindred spirits are people who we've met through school, you know, in Fayetteville and stuff. Mm -hmm. So we really treasured the people up on the mountain. But if I didn't have my contacts through school, and if I didn't have the stimulation of what went on in Fayetteville, um, I don't know that I would have loved it the way I did. Do you know what I mean? Oh. It was the balance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I, here's one of my things. The South, people who, many, many people who live in the South or who live in the North don't understand each other. And, and it, it breaks my heart because the stereotypes are huge. And um, um, it breaks my heart. And I think it's very hurtful to our country, the same as I think racism and the whole thing about slavery is so hurtful to our country. Um, and to have lived in the, both places uh, is kind of fascinating. And so I, one of the things that's happening now in New England is they're really starting to look at and own their involvement in slavery and having slaves themselves up there. So that even um, uh, not many months ago, I went to uh, uh, people in the community were encouraged to read a book together and then go and have a discussion. And this book was about um, a, a family of former slaves who lived right in the area where we are. And people were like, I didn't have any idea. I didn't have any idea. I didn't have any idea. It's like... Yeah, because when you're in the North, you tend to totally be blind to your part in what went on in our country. Mm -hmm. So there's a there's an old story I'm coming to think is kind of quintessential Minnesotan. It's Floyd B. Olson had a heckler once who said, "When the revolution comes, you'll be out." And he said, "Son, when the revolution comes, I'll be leading it." <laughs> and you'll still be a corporal. <laughs> now, I mean, I've heard these stories, these stories from this area around the university a lot of different times, and they keep circling about the fact, around the fact that pretty established institutions like the university, like the Y, uh, were friendlier than than they needed to be <laughs> to some real crazy stuff that was going on just right. down the road. You know, the the, the thirty five <laughs> people sleeping in one room <laughs> and, and being high. You know, twenty two of the twenty four hours of the day. Uh, so, and I'm, I'm curious. You know, uh, kind of about your interface with. I mean, you must have known that there was some really crazy stuff going on. I mean, crazy economic stuff, yeah. uh, crazy political stuff, or at least very radical political stuff, a drug culture, a sex culture. I mean, there was all this stuff was happening. Yeah. How did you, you know, how did you see your interface with that, or how did that, what happened with that all? Uh, well, we knew some people who were involved in different amounts of that and stuff. Um, but when we would come together with those people, that was not our focus. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, so it was like, you know, whatever you're going to do, go ahead and do it. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to do that with you, but go ahead. And so it was sort of that acceptance. And, you know, like, people are so much more than one issue. You know, so for instance, some people who were in, in into... Um, you know, some, some, some group living and a lot of sex stuff and blah, 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 blah. They also had so many other interests, some of which I shared. And I loved sharing that with them. Um, did I want the other part? No. So there just was not a difficulty about that, you know. Uh, as long as what you're doing is not bumping against what I'm doing and preventing me, it kind of didn't matter that much, you know? And and in fact, I'm going to give you an, an example of a kid's physical activity that I used to do with the kids. There's a thing called a Swedish box that you can, it's it's an old gymnastics thing. And and I would put that out and the kids would climb up on that and they, they would jump off 
if they chose to. And then, and then often uh, another teacher and I would hold a rope and the kids could say, you know, move the rope closer, higher, lower, whatever. So they were getting language, they were uh, um, evaluating themselves. And whatever, if I'm a kid, however I jump doesn't influence how you jump. So I might only jump this far away and you might be a great jumper. But the fact that I want it this close doesn't mean that you can't sail when it's your turn. Or the fact that you're sailing and I'm scared of that, I can jump like this. And that's the same philosophy. Those kids, I'm telling you this is the truth, those kids who would come to the gym and do that kind of thing, they knew where everybody else jumped and when somebody would jump farther, they would all cheer for one another. They didn't feel threatened by one another. They didn't feel competitive with one another. They, there was just something about it. And really, I'm telling you, it's sort of the same thing, that, that um, uh, I don't want to do drugs. I didn't used to do marijuana. I didn't whatever. But you know what? And if you do it, I hope you stay safe. But still visit me. When I would get mad is if, um, you know what? If you, expect, if you think our friendship is based on whether or not I'm going to smoke marijuana too, that bugs me. If we can have a friendship, you go ahead and smoke and I don't want to. But, but don't judge me because I don't do it, you know. And people didn't. People here didn't tend to judge. They just let one another be. That's what that was my experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So I've I've had the privilege of talking to uh, about athletics to a lot of competitive athletes, because uh, the way I teach is I say to students, "Tell me the stuff you want to talk about," and they always want to talk about their comp competitive athletic experiences. So I've got, I've got lots of that stuff in my head. And I know that's a big deal in Minnesota. And I'm curious, when you came as the representat representative of non-competitive athletics, <laughs> <laughs> a model I regard as, as somebody who never got the ball, I remember it, 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 it seems to me a lot saner than business. So, but, but, but how, what, how did, I, I guess I'm into interfaces. What was, uh, was there an interface with, uh, with, with, with the competitive folks? Well, you know, I myself, you know, um, yeah, I mean, this is going to be kind of interesting, maybe. First, I want to tell you that I myself, like, I love playing softball and volleyball. I love that stuff. And I was a good athlete. And I would be one of those people chosen first and all that kind of stuff. But it just so happens that I have, uh, that I come from a family of very famous athletes, which you won't have heard of. And the last name was Wistert, W-I-S-T-E-R-T. -E My dad and his two brothers um, are still famous. They're, I mean, in college football, they're the only family in the history of football <laughs> where there were three brothers who went to the same school, which was the University of Michigan. They all played the same position. They all made All-American. They each was so, each of them was so good that the, the number was retired after each one of them. <laughs> and so, uh, I mean, it was like incredible. And then my dad went on and he played for the Philadelphia Eagles for nine years during a time when they were, um, you know, world champs back then. And then, so, um, and I have a son who um, is now a sports medicine doctor. Oh, okay. And he specializes in concussions. Interesting, huh? So, here's the deal. Partly with me too, and and the, the that competitive thing. One thing is, as a young woman, I my dad taught me to love physical activity, and we would do things together. But socially, when I did sports with other people, I wasn't ever supposed to win. Yeah, that was back in the day, and it's only been in recent years when um, I was starting to play pickleball. Do you know pickleball? Mm -hmm. That that I that I I wouldn't let myself win, and I thought this is ridiculous. Well, I love I love winning now, but I I I lift weights and do other things instead of playing pickleball now. But anyway, um, I saw my dad. All I mean, he was really famous in the day, and all people wanted to talk with him about was his football years, and he became such a narrow, narrow person. 
Hmm. Such a narrow person. And then I can remember when I was in college, and I was at Michigan, and what did I major in? Is that? Um, anyway, my mom and dad came out to visit. They were on their way to Philadelphia for some big deal award for the Eagles. And um, my dad was bragging about, about, about speeding and getting stopped. And the, the police officer who stopped him recognized his name and so then escorted him rather than give him a ticket. <laughs> so I said to my dad, I said, well, what if you had been an orchestra conductor? What if you had been a poet? Would any of that had happened? And it was like, I, I was able to see a side of sports that I, that I think is very sad. And I was able to see people become narrowed. And I was able to see it, what I would tell you is a very negative impact. So, um, I don't, that, there you go. That's my experience with it. Um, and you majored in physical and education. And I majored in physical education. And I majored in physical education. And um, that was in 63 I was started school, started undergrad. And um, so I'm in physical education. As far as I know, I'm a totally straight woman. And here are these strange women who are PE majors. They're, you know... <laughs> PE majors were the only people on campus. This was right when people were starting to wear Levi's. This was right when the protests were starting. I'm at Michigan. Michigan is a hotbed for activity. I'm, you know, but the women PE people were supposed to look like women. They were supposed to wear lipstick and skirts. Nobody on campus dressed like that. And it's one of the things that taught me is, you know, these women, they were a bunch of closeted lesbians. And what they taught me was, be yourself and be real. And, and uh, because otherwise, you stand out. It was like ridiculous. <laughs> I tell you, you never know where you learn your lessons. You don't. <laughs> now I'm remembering, I think the building I was thinking of was the Lesbian Resource Center. Do you remember that? Or was that after you left? That, I don't remember that. Yeah, uh-huh. I don't. Yeah. How unbelievable. <laughs> so so I've, I've got to ask, I mean, it's sort of like, you know, it's an interesting tree and it's from lots of branches and you want to know what the latest apple is. So what do you end up doing in retirement with this kind of a, with this kind of a history? Well, when we, we left, um, we left Arkansas the day after our last day of, of teaching, and we headed up to Massachusetts. And Judy is in her late 60s, I'm in my mid-60s. We thought that was old at that moment. That was 11 years ago. And we thought, you know what? We don't have a lot of years to just sit around and make friends, so we've got to get involved right here, right now. And luckily, the community that we're in is real small. It's, it's 18, 20,000. And and not just is it small, but it is so community-based. So it is so easy, not just to get involved, but to have um, a meaningful impact, to be part of the decision makers. Um, so we just instantly got involved in stuff. That The first thing was taking care of um, the gardens at, at one of the public parks and, um, and to join a, a community garden. And when it looked like we were going to have a new mayor who did not believe in community gardens and was going to shut down our community garden, I and um, some other people who were with that community garden, that community garden was on town land. So we started looking around our little town to find other land that where we could put a garden. We ended up finding some land that um, was the old poor farm. You know what a poor farm? Do you know those? Yeah. So I had never heard of them before, but this was the old poor farm in our county. Um, and it was still owned by the town. And anyway, that led to me being involved with um, starting a whole community farm. And I was really active in that. To the And here on our land, I had learned to drive a tractor. I was, I'm a really good tractor driver. <laughs> And I know how to brush hog, and I know how to use a tiller, and I know how to use that front end loader. And uh, so 
I was the one who um, who got to clear the the land to put to put in to start that farm and stuff. So I was doing a lot of tractor work, but to this day, women on tractors are a big deal. Mm -hmm. So I kept having my picture in the paper. Whiskey Rohrbacher's plowing down there, and here I am on that little tractor.